Welcome back, everyone. I hope you stood up and stretched, moved around a little bit between our last session and this one coming up. I am very pleased to welcome several panel members. Uh, we are now embarking on our uh, for our policy panel discussion, and it will be facilitated by Victor Rubin and Laura Stock. And quickly, uh, let me tell you about Victor and Laura. Victor is a researcher, ed educator, and administrator with experience in a wide range of fields in social policy, public health, and urban planning. Dr. Rubin's diverse work efforts can be characterized by a common thread, the application of new knowledge to pressing issues in public policy. He has served as a university-based researcher and adjunct faculty member at the University of California, Berkeley, vice president of research at PolicyLink, a nonprofit organization focused on advancing racial and economic equi equity, a federal grant making official, and an evaluator and consultant across many ses settings. The work has taken him to more than 60 communities and provided firsthand understanding of local, state, and national policy making processes in a field of in a range of fields. He has written many scholarly books and articles and also produced a wide array of materials aimed principally at practitioners in community development, urban planning, public health, and other professionals. Now I will turn to Laura Stock. Laura Stock is the director of the Labor and Occupational Health Program in the School of Public Health Center for <laughs> Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of California, Berkeley. She directs and administers LOHP's programs, providing training, research support, materials development, and technical assistance for workers, employers, health professionals, and the general public. She also facilitates the translation of research findings to practice and public policy, uh, affectionately called R2P2P. Ms. Stock is the principal investigator for a number of statewide worker education initiatives, including the Worker Occupational Safety and Health Training and Education Program, and is a member of the Cal OSHA Standards Board charged with developing occupational safety regulations for the state of California, as well as the NIOSH NORA Committees on Health Work Design. You are in great hands, and uh, let me turn it to Victor. Thank you so much, Christina. And thanks to everybody who has been presenting and who has been participating in this conference. Um, and welcome to a panel on policy issues, opportunities and challenges raised by surveillance, whatever you think of that term, monitoring and data gathering and their consequences for employment, workers' health and organizing. Yesterday, we heard from various presenters evidence of what Lisa Kresge called a regulatory vacuum, which I took to mean an absence of innovative and impactful approaches to public governance of the new applications of digital technology to work. Not necessarily an absence of ideas, but an absence of policies in place. Most of our civil rights framework and our guidelines for fair employment practices date from a pre-digital era. And so the politics as well as the strategies will need to be updated. There are a lot of interesting and important ideas around, such as the AI Bill of Rights that's been referred to and some potentially transferable concepts from other countries, such as those about data privacy in the European Union. But overall, it's still very early days for these kind of policies in the US. And in this area, as with so many issues these days, there the long held common conception of what kind of policies are best created at the local level, what should be the domain of the states, and what should be for federal are completely upended and unsettled. And there's a lot of activity at every level of government. Um, and we'll probably be digging into all of those, and you've heard actually references to all of them over the past two days. Now, fortunately, we have the perfect group to guide us through this rapidly changing and exciting period. We've arranged this as a discussion, as Chris uh, alluded to, in which we will pose several questions for our guests, as well as leaving time for dialogue with you, our participants. 
The breadth of the panelists' roles and experience reflect their expansive, our expansive view of policy at the Labor Lab, including legislation at all levels of government, as I mentioned, from cities and states to the federal government, and even internationally. Regulation and other administrative actions, again, in many sectors, but also the organizing and advocacy by which workers and others raise new issues, build power, and push for changes. With that said, let me introduce our panelists whose full bios are available on the website for the conference. Tim Shaddix is legal director at the Warehouse Worker Resource Center, where he leads the organization's direct legal services and provides strategic counsel on policy and, and organizing campaigns. Welcome, Tim. Julianne Emmons Allison is Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies, Faculty Chair of Sustainability, and Director of Global Studies at the University of California, Riverside. And her colleague, Ellen Reese, is Professor of Sociology and Chair of Labor Studies, also at UC Riverside. She's also Faculty Co-Director of UCR's new Inland Empire Labor and Community Center established just this year. Julianne and Ellen may not both be on at the same times during our talk, but I think one of them will be here at one at, at all times. And in any case, Professor Reese, Professor Reese and Professor Allen, Allison presented their research on Amazon warehouse workers in inland Southern California in an excellent webinar for the Labor Lab almost exactly a year ago. The date was April 27th, 2022. And you can find a recording of that session on the events and news section of the Labor Lab website, and I encourage you to check that out. Mitch Steiger is a legislative advocate for the California Labor Federation, AFL-CIO, which represents over 1,200 affiliated unions and 2.1 million union members, fighting to defend the wages, benefits, and working conditions of all Californians. And if I'm not mistaken, I heard Mitch ask at least one question earlier today. And finally, he's Matt Scherer. He's the Senior Policy Counsel for Workers' Rights and Technology Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. His work focuses on the use of AI in hiring, something we've heard a lot about over the last two days, and other employment decisions, workplace privacy, and surveillance, and helping workers use technology and data to empower themselves. And I heard at least one speaker earlier foreshadow his remarks. So thank you to all of you for joining and for uh, working with us in this panel. And you're going to be an expert hands as we turn the facilitation over to Laura Stock um, at this time. Laura is of course, the Director of Community Engagement for the Labor Lab and responsible for bringing many of these folks together. Laura? Thank you, Victor. Um, and uh, it's nice to be here with everyone this afternoon and really appreciate all of you participating. As Victor said, you're the perfect person to um, engage in this discussion. Um, and as was said, our plan for the panel is to, to have it be more like um, a conversation to that end. We have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask, um, and we'll give each of you approximately five minutes or so for each of them um, in order to be able to have some time at the end for, for discussion. Um, and I can tell you now what the two questions are going to be. The first is going to give, um, I'm going to ask each of you to add anything you'd like to the introduction that, that Victor has already made. Um, describe a little bit about the work of your organization and the audience you represent. And, and why the issue of surveillance and monitoring is important to your organization and the people that you represent. So we're gonna give each of you an opportunity to answer that question. And then we're gonna come back specifically to give you a chance to describe what you think the most important policy changes and actions that need um, are needed to address the problems that we've heard of um, during this conference. And that would include policies, campaigns, organizing, whatever arena in which you think work needs to be done. So um, that's our plan. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to start by 
asking Tim to answer the first question about the work of your organization, who you represent, and why this issue um, is important, how it's impacted the people you represent. So Tim. Great, thanks, Laura, and yeah, so happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, so again, yeah, I work with the Warehouse Worker Resource Center. We're a nonprofit organization uh, based in Southern California. Our offices are in Ontario. We work across Southern California, but primarily in the Inland Empire and San Bernardino and Riverside counties. We've been around for uh, over 10 years, and we work directly with uh, workers in the warehousing and logistics industry, primarily in warehousing. Um, and we support workers um, with you know, taking direct action in the workplace to improve their working conditions. Um, we are not, you know, a labor union, so we're not able to, you know, work with workers directly on unionizing, but we've supported workers in many campaigns over the years around improving health and safety, pushing back against, you know, unfair pay practices like peace rate and other things like that, and have won, you know, lasting changes in, in numerous workplaces um, through that route. Um, we also, you know, uh, alongside our, our sort of base of warehouse workers push for policy changes um, and engage in certain, you know, legal actions and complaints to support workers' rights and do a lot of um, kind of know your rights education uh, in the community as well. Um, and, you know, we're one of the only um, resources in that, that region also for workers' rights generally. So we also have a, a legal clinic that provides legal services to workers across all industries. Um, and you know, for for as long as we've been doing our work, and and longer, warehouse workers and many other low wage workers have been dealing with um, a lot of issues that we see that the sort of surveillance framework has just uh, amplified, uh, which is you know dealing with workplaces that are really imbalanced in terms of sort of control and democracy in the workplace, uh, where employers you know hold uh, a disproportionate amount of power and are able to dictate a lot of the terms of of working conditions. Uh, leading to a lot of, uh, you know, unsafe uh, conditions, a lot of injuries, um, a lot of violations of basic workplace rights, because workers uh, often face a lot of retaliation when speaking up. Uh, and we've seen also that, you know, the industry is a, is a very dangerous industry. There's, you know, uh, elevated rates of, of injuries in warehousing generally, uh, about, about double the average of, of the private general industry. Um, a, lot, a lot of that coming from, you um, ergonomic injuries. There's a lot of repetitive motion, a lot of awkward postures, a lot of uh, he very heavy work in warehousing, a lot of very serious injuries, a lot of long-term injuries. Um, also, you know, issues around people might not think about, but heat illness, things like that. Uh, it's very problematic in, in warehouse workplaces. And so what we've seen is that, you know, th those are underlying issues that really have just been ramped up with the introduction over the past 10 years or so of um, these new technologies that we've been talking about in this, this conference uh, of workplace surveillance and then also, you know, algorithmic management and uh, electronic sort of task management systems um, that employers have increasingly been using to kind of ratchet up their control over the workplace and to put increasing uh, pressure on workers to work faster and harder and, and longer. Um, and so uh, we see that as having had really just uh, you know, terrible effects for, for workers uh, in, in warehouses over the past 10 years or so uh, in terms of, um, you know, most immediately just, you know, increasing rates of injury, um, seeing workers having to work faster as these systems are able to, to push them to work faster and faster in ways that we can, that have been discussed already, I'm happy to get into more, uh, that leads to more injuries. And just it's the, the again, the overarching sort of disproportionate power and lack of transparency and accountability that these systems have and put into the hands of employers uh, is just undermining also sort of the, some of the fundamental basic rights uh, that we see in warehousing and that workers and the labor movement have fought for for over 100 years. Uh, that if workers are being constantly monitored and pushed to meet certain expectations, uh, we see that they sometimes are not able to take their, you know, their breaks uh, that they've, you know, are entitled to that. Uh, workers feel like um, they're being watched all the time, and so they are feel more likely to be subject to retaliation. Uh, it's harder to organize when you're being monitored constantly. Um, so we've seen seen these systems in that way um, are really a, you know have this this direct immediate impact on sort of you know quality of work and dignity. Have this impact in increasing injuries. We think in a really terrible way, but then also really have this um, very fundamental threat of undermining our our, our rights and basic working conditions. Um, and so, so yeah, that's why you know workers have and 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 us working alongside them have turned to focus to to these issues in recent years and made them a priority. So, uh, probably over five minutes there, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, 
That's great. And we look forward when we come around to you again to hearing about some of the work you've done to develop policies to address that. So thank you, Tim. So Ellen, um, I'll turn it over to you for your introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Ellen Reese uh, from UC Riverside. And so Riverside is in the Inland Empire, which, as you've just heard, is is a major hub for warehousing. Um, so it's, you know, the logistics and warehousing industry is, you know, one of the major uh, employing industries in our region. Um, and, and we see that, you know, firsthand with our students at UC Riverside, uh, many of whom are student workers, many of them work in the warehouse industry. And if they haven't worked in it, they know somebody, <laughs> you know, their sibling, their family member um, has worked in the industry. Um, and so it, yeah, it really does impact, um, the student population at my university. Um, and, uh, as my introduction uh, said, uh, we've started a new uh, labor center, the Inland Empire Labor and Community Center, and we're really excited um, to provide education and leadership development and research, you know, in support of a worker center economy. So I think I think I'm also interested in this issue from that perspective as well. And we work, um, you know, in partnership with uh, community and labor organizations. Uh, including the Warehouse Worker Resource Center, among others, um, uh, in doing the work that we do. Um, and we're really excited to be launching um, Labor Summer uh, this year. Uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, uh, placing students in paid internships uh, over the summer, um, doing all sorts of, of really fantastic work, um, uh, working in partnership with the local labor movement, you know, and so I think, uh, yeah, I think this issue is is really important, um, you know, and as a researcher, too, I, I uh, have looked at this issue uh, uh, with a team of student uh, workers, you know, and and student uh, researchers that uh, did some interviews with warehouse workers who are, you know, experiencing firsthand, you know, the the tremendous pressure of work having to, you know, make rate, having to not have too many uh, errors, you know, uh, and not spend too much time off task and just being constantly monitored. Um, so yeah, as a researcher too, um, you know, just hearing firsthand the workers' stories, you know, about just how stressful this is, how, you know, then they're, you know, rushing to make rate and, and you know, injuries happen, you know, more, more so when workers are, are um, doing things quickly and under pressure like that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I think for many reasons, I'm, I'm very concerned about this issue. Thank you, Ellen, and congratulations on the formation of your new labor center. We really are excited about working with you on that. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Mitch. Thank you, Laura. Um, my name is Mitch Steiger. I'm a legislative advocate with the California Labor Federation here in Sacramento. And we, um, I guess just to build a little bit on the, the bio, we technically don't have union members. We have affiliates. So we are made up of uh, about 1,200 affiliated unions uh, that cover all sorts of different industry sectors, public and private sector, construction, a lot of office employees, grocery store workers, pretty much everything you can think of. We, we have workers who do that kind of work. And as a result of that, um, you know, we cover pretty much every issue area. We also really try to provide a unified voice for all workers in California, not just those who are in unions. Obviously, most, most workers are not in unions, and we think all workers deserve a much better deal than they're getting now. And so we really work to try to provide a voice for that. And so in covering all these different issues, we um, you know, I mean, we we really try to keep an eye on everything that could be that could be harming workers. So obviously our priority is always protecting the right to organize, but then we also spend a lot of time focused on wage and hour issues, worker safety and health, um, access to work, uh, public sector job standards, uh, all sorts of different issue areas. And we noticed not too long ago that this broader issue of technology and work from automated decision-making systems to AI, to automation overall, to algorithmic management, that not only were these having pretty serious and usually negative effects on workers, but it, they were having effects in all of these different areas in which we work. So <clears throat> we're not, you know, we're not naturally very techy people. We don't 
think a whole lot of the tech industry, frankly, but we've kind of had to become experts in all of this because it affects everything that we do in all sorts of different ways. <clears throat> and so we've we've sponsored legislation in this area. Most of what we do here at the Labor Fed focuses on the state level and state law. So we spend a lot of time over in the legislature trying to get good bills through, trying to stop bad bills or fix bad bills. We also spend a lot of time uh, with regulatory agencies. Um, as Laura is painfully aware, I spent a lot of time at the Cal OSHA Standards Board complaining about one thing or another. She's the, uh, the star member of that board and uh, also spent a lot of time talking to internal agency staff about a lot of these different issues. And so what we have learned is that all of these different technologies kind of left unchecked for the most part can really make life miserable for workers, take a bad job and make it much worse can end your job and replace it with a robot. And there really isn't much in the way of a, of, of a strong voice out there defending the rights of workers. And so we're very lucky to be part of a coalition that goes beyond labor to include great groups like the Warehouse Workers Resource Center and uh, a lot of other different organizations that are really trying to kind of put the brakes on some of this technology. Um, and really we think try to, ref uh, our position on all of this is that technology is not necessarily bad, that, there are plenty of examples out there of technology improving things for workers, that there are a lot of examples of technology making work less dangerous, um, allowing workers to focus on the most important parts of their jobs, but there are plenty of examples, probably far more examples of this technology harming workers. And our position is basically that we should focus this technology on where it makes things better for workers and where it doesn't if all it's doing is <clears throat> enriching a very small number of people at great cost to workers and at great societal cost, it shouldn't happen. And we should stop it whatever way we can, whether that's through laws or regulations or whatever needs to happen. And so that's kind of the, the philosophy that drives what we do. And we try to apply that as much as possible. And um, I'm happy to talk more about some of the specifics later on when we get to that section of it. Thank you, Mitch. Yeah, uh, when we come around to the next round, we we'll look forward to hearing about specific bills that are maybe in the works or what you might be advocating for. Um, so um, I just noticed that Julianne um, has joined us from UC Riverside. Um, and um, so we have two, we have you and we have Matt Schur that we're going to as part of our very first question, Julianne, which was just to take a few minutes um, just to recap for you since you just joined, we're gonna be um, sort of having two questions for you all. And the first is just to provide any additional information beyond the short introduction about your own um, experience and why this issue is important to you um, for just a couple of minutes. Um, and then we're gonna go around a second time to ask people to share their policy recommendations and what kind of actions they think are necessary. So we're in the introduction phase. So Julian, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll go to you, Matt. All right, thank you. So um, my, I guess there's two strains and a part of it Ellen already spoke about because we just completed a book and um, my most intimate knowledge about the issues really come from that interview process and writing up uh, that material and doing the research to kind of uh, to contextualize what we had learned. Um, the other piece of it is I've always had a very broad understanding of what sustainability means. And a part of that, of course, is sustaining our social systems and, you know, our health and our economies um, at a local level. And so along with Ellen and some others on our campus, we recently formed a new department of society, environment and health equity. And it's bringing together both those of us who have been part of a sustainability studies major for some time. Um, and we're all based in gender studies. So we have a gender and intersectional lens on that. And then folks that have been looking more at health equity and some other economic issues. And so we have people from across the disciplines within the um, um, arts, humanities, and sciences in that new department. And so this is going to be among um, the issues that I'm sure we'll be looking at um, as being so central to our region. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us. <clears throat> so Matt, let me give you the floor now. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., although I'm based in Portland, Oregon. And it is half think tank, half advocacy organization. 
CDT has been around since the dawn of the World Wide Web in the 90s, and it's been advocating for individual rights and liberties in connection with technology since that time. Increasingly, CDT is focused on the ways in which technology affects people from marginalized and historically disadvantaged groups. And we have different project teams that the different work streams that CDT are organized around. My uh, work stream is workers' rights, and that's part of the privacy and data team. And I examine the policy issues surrounding the intersection between technology in the workplace and labor market. And a connecting thread of my work is that to date, technology has largely been used in ways that exacerbate existing inequalities and power imbalances in the workplace and labor market. So it exacerbates the gap in power between workers and employers, and it also widens the gaps between different groups of workers, disadvantaging workers that are already underrepresented or historically disadvantaged. Surveillance is one of the main areas of focus for me because it's one of the prime examples of how that can happen. Companies collect massive amounts of data on workers, often without workers even knowing what data is collected or why. And conversely, workers often lack the ability to access the data that employers gather on them, much less collect their own data in the workplace. So this allows employers to exert even more control over workers, as well as the narrative about what happens in the workplace. The data that is collected through surveillance and surveillance practices themselves are also often used in ways that harm workers. As Tim alluded to, uh, employers are often using these tools to massively increase the pace of work, eliminating even brief periods of downtime for workers, pushing workers to and past their physical and psychological limits. This threatens workers' health and safety. Uh, it leads to more repetitive motion injuries, as Tim indicated. It also results in an increase in job strain, which is a phenomenon that occurs when workers face increased job demands but have little control over their work. And that leads as a large body of research that shows that leads to a variety of negative mental and physical health consequences. The, these technologies can also particularly disadvantage workers from disadvantaged groups, um, already disadvantaged groups, I should say. So one of the main areas of focus for my project is how electronic surveillance, particularly when it's paired with automated systems, can harm disabled workers. Often surveillance tools are implemented in a way that doesn't account for these workers' right to accommodation under federal and state law. And when surveillance systems look for things that are out of the ordinary or abnormal, they often will identify the actions of disabled workers and other underrepresented groups as suspicious. So disabled workers, for instance, might need more frequent breaks or they might move or express themselves in different ways. And if systems are in place that looks for what's abnormal and flags that as suspicious or somehow harmful, then that further marginalizes disabled workers. So in short, these technologies can really serve as a lever that widens gaps that already exist between the groups that are already the haves and the have nots in the labor market. And that's why it remains a major area of focus for me. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you everyone for providing that background. And now we wanna to turn to what, what steps need to be taken to address these issues, both po what policies are already in place, what new demands should people be making, what kind of campaigns should people be involved in or already involved in. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go back to you, Tim, um, and, and hear more about the work you've done. And I know there's a specific algorithmic law that you were instrumental in helping get passed. And I assume you'll be sharing some information about that among other things. So Tim. I have to unmute myself. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think obviously we've identified here that there's huge just gaps in you know rights and regulations around around the cluster of issues in this area so i think there's a lot that needs to be done um in thinking about warehouse workers i think we've thought about two large kind of buckets of thinking about um rights and regulation in this area one is you know trying to you know have some some better transparency and rights around the use of the technology itself and then the other is, you know, thinking about how you can we can try to put limits on some of the effects of it. Um, so as I mentioned, like one of the effects that we see um, very, you know, problematically in warehousing is the the increased pace of work and those demands leading to more injuries. Um, so uh, you know, we I I think you know you could you could take the position that okay we should just you know if we just kind of 
put really strong restraints on the use of a lot of this, these sort of surveillance-based electronic, you know, task management systems, and that might take away the tools to push workers that fast. But it, that's a very, I think, slippery thing to get a handle on. Uh, we see in warehousing a lot of different kinds of technologies being used for that. We also see still just like old-fashioned, you know, conveyor belt speed or just pressure from managers, um, you know, having that effect. And then sometimes it's, you know, it's getting increased by some connection to a surveillance-based system, but it's not entirely the surveillance-based system. So I think, you know, we think it's important to, to address kind of both of those angles. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, in, you know, nationally and in California, we have very weak regulations just in terms of health and safety around uh, ergonomic injuries and repetitive motion injuries. Um, so I think regardless of what we do around regulating the kind of surveillance-based technologies, we also need to have some sort of safeguards around whatever technology or, you know, analog means employers are using to push workers in these ways, that there's got to just be limits on those, those uh, outcomes. So, yeah, I, I think, and you alluded to it, Laura, a couple of years ago, we worked on a bill in California that was trying to, um, uh, and I think, you know, will succeed in some ways in addressing both of those pieces of the puzzle a little bit, um, taking first steps in, in those directions. So, uh, in 2021, we we advocated for and helped to pass a, a bill called AB 701 in California um, that on sort of the first bucket of trying to have more kind of fairness and transparency around the use of these systems requires warehouse employers, large warehouse employers um, who have um, these kind of quota based systems, which the law defines as like a quanti having um productivity expectations of like, like quantified amount of tasks to be completed in a quantified amount of time to have to provide written descriptions of, of those quotas and the consequences for not meeting them to workers up front and puts restrictions on workers and disciplining employ uh, workers for not meeting those quotas if they didn't provide those descriptions. It also allows workers to actually request copies of the data that's collected on their own performance of those quotas. Um, so getting into sort of some transparency uh, around that data um, in certain circumstances, and then on the kind of the other end of the of the, of of the of the, of the um, issue in terms of the the effects, it's also you know puts new sort of violations in the labor code around um, any kind of uh, quota system that results in uh, occupational safety and health laws being violated, results in workers not being able to take their uh, meal breaks or their lunch breaks. So again, that it was trying to address. Um, as I mentioned, that we see these systems resulting in undermining other basic rights that we fought so so long and hard for in, in the labor movement. So that bill went into effect uh, just in January 1 of 2022. I think it's pretty pretty early to see the effect. It's not going to fix everything because it was just a first step, kind of the, really the first bill in the country to start to address some of these things together. I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of um, you know, maybe putting more guardrails around how data is used and sort of, you know, um, in you know any kind of termination process or any kind of adverse action against employees, uh, so that should be much more rigorous and transparent. Uh, we also you know push for having an actual new uh, Cal OSHA standard around warehouse ergonomic injuries in that bill that had to be taken out. Um, but again, that's just a huge gap in our safety regulations, both in California and at the national level. Um, so I think there's more that can be done there. Um, you know, I think um, AB 701 has the potential. If it's enforced, you know, vigorously, if the courts interpret it, you know, accurately to the legislative intent behind it, to make some significant improvements in working conditions in the industry, because it would, you know, it really, it really does um, prohibit some of the most egregious practices that we've seen in the industry of um, these quotas that are set so high that workers just, in order to keep up with their rate, really are not able to follow all of the the health and safety regulations you would expect to be in place in a warehouse to keep workers safe. Um, that may prevent them from taking breaks. Um, and that certainly, you know, we're still seeing to this day that a lot of employers are, are not providing anywhere near the transparency that the bill requires. And the bill requires only the barest minimum. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, we're um, cautiously optimistic uh, that over the next few years, uh, we'll maybe be able to see some uh, good enforcement around that law. And that might, you know, start to make a few changes around the edges on these issues. Um, but certainly, certainly, I think a lot, a lot more, um, it needs to be done in this area, both on both the safety side and on, on the regulating the technology side. Uh, thank you, Tim. And now um, I'm going to go to you, Mitch, to describe um, the work the Labor Fed is doing or, or recommendations you have of what should be done. 
Sure. So uh, our work in this area can kind of be thought of as falling into, I guess, a few different layers, I guess, to kind of break it up into three. The top one is more kind of an immediate self-preservation, protecting our right to even exist as workers as we face a lot of technology that exists specifically to get rid of workers and us pushing back against that. <clears throat> and then below that is, I guess, bills and regulations that we are more of a proactive kind of, we are trying to expand workers' rights in this area where we're trying to make sure workers know more about the kind of monitoring that they're actually being subjected to, that they have greater rights with respect to the sort of technology that Tim's been talking a lot about and doing more to limit the kind of monitoring that happens outside of work that can make uh, union organizing very difficult. And then kind of the foundation of all of that is this constant war that we're in against this perspective among a lot of the decision makers in this world that technology is just great. We should just let it all move forward and whatever's going to happen is going to happen and let it all flourish. And we don't really need to, you know, the more regulation, the worse. And so I guess to, to start with the first one, <clears throat> we are sponsoring a bill, AB 316, related to automated trucking that, among other things, requires there to be a human operator on heavy duty trucks. They are starting to do a lot of testing of autonomous heavy, you know, 18 wheelers out there without anyone driving them. And um, <clears throat> it's not very well regulated. And so it's it's a huge priority for our Teamster affiliates and one that has actually had a lot of success in the legislature. There are Republican co-sponsors to that bill. The votes out of policy committees have been great so far. Um, so that that's kind of what, what we're talking about when it's here's a direct threat kind of a defensive thing, we're going to go right after it and make sure that workers' jobs are protected. Um, and also our, our ongoing war against automated tractors at the Cal OSHA Standards Board is another one of those where the industry has made it very clear that they don't think tractors should have workers on them. And they make all sorts of ridiculous arguments like because tractors are dangerous, they should all be automated or because pesticides can be dangerous, uh, they should not have workers on them. And they make a whole lot of other arguments along those lines that, uh, you know, we, we'd love to get more into if we had more time. But just in the interest of time, it is a bunch of employers and a bunch of tech industry consultants giving all of these reasons for why workers should no longer exist in this industry and us kind of pushing back against their efforts to petition the board or create advisory committees with the board or even do legislation as they've tried to do and just kind of batting those down as much as we can so that workers still have access to those jobs. So that, that's kind of the top layer of things that we do. And then as far as more broadly expanding workers' rights, we sponsored legislation last year, AB 1651, that tried to do a number of things in this area from expanding a worker's right to know about the kinds of technology that are being used, the kinds of surveillance and, and ADSs that are being used against them, um, the kinds of algorithmic management that are happening at head language and they're requiring impact statements. It totally prohibited monitoring outside of work, except in very limited circumstances, and was kind of our big attempt with a big coalition of both labor and other groups to, to really take a big bite out of this problem, kind of build on uh, CIPRA that a lot of people are probably aware of, the California Privacy Rights Act, that does give some rights to workers on this front, but doesn't go nearly far enough. So we were kind of trying to take that, you know, use that as kind of a springboard to give workers something much closer to what they need. And that bill uh, got through the Assembly Labor Committee, no problem, but then found a much less willing audience in the Assembly Privacy Committee. Uh, obviously, the tech industry really hated that bill and worked very hard to kill it. And so, um, you know, it's an issue that we very much plan to revisit in the future. But as it stands right now, that legislation and nothing like it is likely going anywhere this year. There are a handful of bills in the California legislature this year that that deal with these issues, none of which were uh, we were heavily involved in. And it kind of connects with that foundational issue I was talking about earlier, where there is a perspective out there that is very problematic that we need to do what we can to fix. And all of these bills that are going through the legislature right now if they even mention workers at all, we're kind of an afterthought. And where there is concern about AI and ADSs and algorithms, it, it doesn't focus on some of the issues we've been talking about here in that it jeopardizes workers' health and safety and their ability to organize. It's more, it's more focused on issues like discrimination and harming marginalized communities, which is a focus we absolutely share. 
but we would just add, there are a whole lot of other problems here that need to be folded in. And so a lot of what we do with these bills is going to the author's office and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're here. And we also have a lot of concerns with this that need to be folded into your work group or your bill of rights or whatever's happening. And we also, I guess, just to kind of try to wrap it up, in terms of that foundation of trying to shift the perspective, what, what we're really trying to do in all of these different settings is kind of push back against a lot of the success that the tech industry has had in describing this technology as just the wave of the future and that it's inevitable and it's bringing a lot of jobs to California and as such needs to be protected and expanded. And they always kind of fudge the numbers around how many jobs they're creating versus how many jobs they're destroying. And so we're always there to raise our hands and try to be as loud as we possibly can about the jobs that are being lost and whether or not the jobs we're creating are even in California. I mean, are, it, are we killing 10 jobs to create one? Are we killing 50 to create one? And if this is as inevitable as the industry says it is, and not that we necessarily agree with that, but if so, we need to have a plan to deal with the economy of the future because we right now have a legislature made up of you know, very wealthy, successful people who have not yet had their jobs automated away. And so they need that perspective and they need to understand that we would be talking about eliminating hundreds of thousands or millions of jobs with very dire consequences for the future functioning of you know, society, not to be um, you know, too alarmist, but we think it's a very real concern and we need to have a plan for the economy of the future, regardless of what happens with this technology to make sure that things continue to function and that California remains a, a great place to live. And so wherever we can, we try to raise some concerns about this technology and also really try to refocus attention on the need to kind of plan for whatever's coming. Great, thank you, Mitch. Um, and I wanna just um, remind participants, um, we're gonna be hearing from Ellen and Julianne, Julianne and Matt, and then we're gonna open the floor to questions from people who are listening. So as a reminder, um, feel free to start dropping any questions you have in the Q&A um, box, and, and we'll turn to those after our panelists have completed their remarks. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it to Ellen um, and see what you'd like to add in terms of recommendations for change. Yeah, well, I think the AB 701 is definitely a model legislation, and I think uh, New York has, has passed some similar legislation to it, but many more states need it, need that kind of legislation. We need it at the national level, right? But, you know, more states need to do it. But I think... Um, you know, to really exercise the rights under that new law, right, much more organizing has to happen, much more outreach has to happen so that workers are aware of their new rights. Um, and I, you know, as a educator, I try to work it into <laughs> one of my lectures or something and, and, and talk about it. And a lot of students hadn't heard about it. They never heard of that. They do have this, this new, these new sets of rights. So I think, you know, just doing much more outreach is really important so that workers know about their rights. Um, but, you know, but then as an individual worker, it's often really intimidating to exercise those rights, right? So I think, you know, doing doing organizing so that, you know, individual workers don't have to com complain as an individual, you know, but, but you know, through a group, uh, through a campaign, you know, I think, um, it really would help to put that legislation into life, right? So that workers are actually able to exercise it. And I, you know, definitely we need to, you know, litigate, you know, when that when you know employers violate the their rights, but you know, that can take a long time, right? And so I think there needs to be both organizing and litigation, right? Hand in hand, right? And and to really um put uh, employers, put the pressure on employers, you know, when they're violating rights. And, you know, and I think it's pretty commonplace that a lot of, you know, warehouse workers, you know, they often feel like they can't use the bathroom, right? Because if they use the bathroom, they're not going to make rate or they spend too much time off task because these warehouses are enormous and getting to the bathroom and back and so on. Right. And so that's often just like sort of commonplace and 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 people, yeah, uh, deal with that in all sorts of ways. Sometimes they reduce drinking water right in a place that gets very, very hot. Right. And so there's issues of dehydration. Right. And and all sorts of other health issues um, that, that get compounded. You know, so I think I think these are. Um, 
real issues and and it's great that we have this legislation but i think we need to do much more about organizing and and outreach right and so that that workers are aware they have those rights and and can exercise those rights together right as part of a campaign and really put the pressure on an employer uh to follow through you know and making sure their their workplaces are are uh abiding by the standards that we have Yes, thank you, Ellen. And and Julianne, do you do you have something you want to add to that? Um, I think what I would do is enlarge <laughs> what um, Ellen is saying. I, I agree entirely that the uh, litigation and the outreach and the greater organizing is important. Um, but I think we need to think about the workers in the context in which they're working. So, for instance, um, think about like the pipeline that is taking students from the high schools into the Amazon warehouses or the people that are being faced with changes to the technologies that will be required for their trucks that are moving in and out of the warehouses. I think if you organize by bringing more groups of people with related interests together, it can put kind of this broad sort of pressure and it brings all of those groups to bear on any of the different issues that arise. And I know that it's very, very difficult, but we've seen that happen in our region um, you know, kind of over, over the course of, you know, many years where we've seen different elements from the environmentalists, the environmental justice, labor, um, faith-based organizer, um, organizers, uh, the different kinds of communities, all the different, you know, small community organizations um, coming together. And as we talk about in our, our book, maybe a really good example of that is the San Bernardino Airport um, expansion to accommodate uh, Amazon. That might be the most recent broadest kind of swath and although the focus was the airport, if you were to draw out individual people, they might have a particular perspective in terms of what's the future of my child here, what's the future of the kinds of jobs that either the people in my family have or myself have. Maybe it's the you know the air pollution and the young people and the old people and their families. So it's it it is. I mean, some of the the legislation is specifically about a, these very small and particular things, but the imp, the implications are huge. And I think in organizing, we can take advantage um, of the way that this these issues uh, face all of us. Thank you, Julianne. And Matt, what are your perspective on what changes are needed and strategies to get there? Well, pretty much anything would be an improvement over what exists right now, uh, which is basically that there are virtually no hard limits on what data employers can collect on their workers and why. Um, and what surveillance they can conduct. So even basic disclosure requirements would be helpful, telling workers what data is being collected and why. Uh, so like AB 701, um, making sure that workers understand what standard they're being measured against. That said, this that by itself is not enough. Simply knowing that workers' rights are being threatened and that their dignity is is being violated, that's not a substitute for real change. Um, and that was a point made in a report that AI Now released earlier this year, which made the argument that transparency requirements are no substitute for policy actions that actually attack the power disparities that these technologies represent and widen. So bright line rules are needed. Um, there need to be limitations on purpose where employers should only be allowed to collect data if it's for a legitimate non-harmful purpose and harmful uses of surveillance technology should be prescribed in some way, um, if not banned outright. And there also needs to be for workers a right to access data that the employers collect, the right to collect their own and data portability. Um, they need to be able to take data that is collected about them and use it for their own purposes, giving them some agency in the data that the employer collects on them. This would reduce the information gap that exists between employers and employees. And the CCPA, which newly is now applicable to employment data, takes some steps in that direction, but it's not enough. The CCPA, for instance, doesn't impose any limitations, any hard limits on what reasons employers can collect data on workers. Um, and really, there seems to be an assumption that I think policymakers uh, don't always state, but that it's underpinning a lot of the kind of policy making thought in this space, which is that whatever happens in the workplace is the business of the business rather than the worker. 
And if you're gathering data on a particular worker, I think that there should be a paradigm shift in how we view that, that that data on that worker should just as much be uh, the interest in the, in the property, if you want to call it that, of the worker as it is of the employer that collected it. So AB 1651, um, which Mitch alluded to, that's an example of a bill that would have directly advanced a lot of those objectives. It would have restricted harmful uses of surveillance, and it would have given workers more agency in whether and how technology is being used in the workplace. And another point that Mitch made that I'll echo is that not all technological innovation represents progress. When technology is used in ways that threaten workers' health, safety, and legal rights, that's not good innovation. It's not something that should be applauded, and it doesn't represent progress. So the policy shouldn't be hampered by the fact that, oh, if you make these uh, rules and these regulations regarding how these technologies are developed and deployed, you might be hampering innovation. Well, that's only a problem if the innovation that it's hampering is good innovation. But in a lot of cases, what we're seeing here is that the innovation in question is not really beneficial to workers. Uh, thank you, Matt. That's a really, really important point that I mean, I think the point you raised, Mission, that you're expanding on is what the general view of the sort of pro-technology view. And it's really um, it's important to develop our arguments around that. Um, and we have two questions. And um, actually, I'm going to start with one that's very relevant to the point that you just made um, from, from the participants. Um, what does the best case scenario of the economy of the future look like? What positive alternatives might the labor perspective in comparison to the corporate tech industry perspective generate regarding technology and workers? Like what's the positive vision that we might want to pose as an alternative to what's happening? So um, I'm going to throw that out to whoever would like to, to uh, start there. Mitch, it looks like you unmuted yourself first. Sure, I guess one short way of describing where we think things should go at, at the risk of making you sit through the same thing that I say at every standards board meeting on autonomous tractors is that we need to start taking the advantages of human workers and the advantages of technology and bringing them together and trying to use both to the advantage of each. So for example, the industry is right that every now and then workers do make mistakes. Sometimes workers are overworked. Sometimes they haven't received the training that they need. And some of this technology can sometimes come in and, and fill in the gaps and keep workers more safe, make whatever their job duties are be achieved more quickly and more efficiently. And <clears throat> there, there is definitely a place for that. But there are also advantages to people. And the thing with this technology, as we all know, is that it often doesn't work. It often breaks down and glitches and does things that it's not supposed to. And so you need a trained human operator there to step in to take over the tractor or monitor the algorithm that's watching workers or do whatever so that um, the, the advantages of both can be brought together. And what we think the economy of the future looks like is one where all of this technology is built around a worker. It starts from the place of we are not trying to get rid of people we are trying to help maximize what people are good at and kind of, you know, make them better at their jobs, make their jobs safer. Um, you know, maybe you can give them more money. Uh, this upskilling that we often hear about from the industry is a real thing and something that, that we support as long as you don't get rid of tons and tons of jobs in the process. So I guess for us, the short way of saying all that is that the economy of the future is one that's where the technology is built around workers, not built to replace workers. Great, thank you. And, and anyone else want to weigh in on that before we go to the next question? Great answer, Matt. Did you want to um, add something? Yeah, just, yeah, I'll, I'll add that, I'll go back to the idea that workers should, should have more agency and more uh, rights in the data that is collected in the workplace that relates to them. Um, I'd like to see a workplace of the future where the assumption that once you clock in, you kind of sign over the right to control and decide what you do and what information is collected on you over to the employer. Um, there's obviously some, there's a, there's a lot of limitations on what employers can and can't do on the job, but so far that hasn't seeped into the area of data collection and surveillance. And um, 
that's one of the areas where kind of the default rules that govern employers from common law, uh, which if you're a lawyer um, and you're familiar with kind of the common law history of where our employment law defaults come from, they actually, and people are often surprised to know this, come from Old England and specifically the relationships that existed between masters and domestic servants. And we've gotten past that with bypassing some health and safety laws and wage and hour laws so that there has to be a minimum wage. But there still is this largely an assumption that privacy and agency over information that is gathered in the workplace is kind of the exclusive domain of the employer. And I'd like to see a future workplace where there's a recognition that workers have just as much an information, uh, just as much of an interest in the information that is collected on them in the workplace as the employer has. Thank you, Matt. And Tim, I think I saw you unmute yourself. You had something to add. Uh, yeah, I want it's actually very similar to what Matt was saying. Is that I, I mean, I agree with what Mitch was saying too, that like we need, you know, there's plenty of examples of technology that actually could help obviously uh, improve safety, improve working conditions a ton. And so it's a, partly a question of design and centering that, but then also a question of control over the use of that technology. Um, you know, I think even technology that's designed really well, if the employer still has the control, ultimate control over all of how that's used, you know, the obviously just incentives start to go in different directions uh, at various points. Um, so it is, you know, we're going to need sort of stronger legal frameworks, a different legal paradigm, I think, as Matt was saying about who really owns uh, data and information to give workers the right to do certain things. But even if we have that, we're still going to need very robust organizing, uh, probably, you know, in a workplace by workplace, uh, you know, way of workers actually fighting and, and using those rights to take some control over how this technology is, is used. Um, and I think as Matt was pointing out, like it just, it, all this just really highlights the underlying power imbalances we have in our general legal employment frameworks of things like at-will employment, um, that the, you know, the technology is just an additional tool for employers to use in these ways that are really harmful to workers. Uh, and so it's about, it's about the technology, but honestly, to really address this technology, it's about also addressing those power imbalances uh, in terms of infrastructure for workers to organize rights for workers to organize, rights for workers to be protected in their jobs, to keep their jobs, um, to be able to actually engage in a struggle over the use of this technology on, on more of a level playing field. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go to another uh, question from participants, and then I'm going to go to Victor, because I know, Victor, you had a question or two you wanted to ask as well. Um, but first, um, the question came in, what are your thoughts on the necessity usefulness of a universal basic income and its possible relevance to many of the issues raised in this conference? So anyone like to respond to that question? Mitch, and then Julianne, I'll go to you next. So Mitch, you want to start and then? Sure, I, I, I can say from our perspective, we have a, a complicated uh, set of concerns with universal basic income. Well, we take very seriously this principle of eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what you will. And if, if the goal of universal basic income was to give workers more time for what we will, I think we would look at it pretty differently. But so far, it would seem like the pilot programs that are out there combined with who the most vocal proponents of universal basic income have been create a lot of concern with us that kind of overwhelm whatever conceptual advantages a universal basic income system might have that it tends to be most vocally promoted by this weird world of very wealthy techno capitalists who are going to make all of their money by getting rid of everyone's jobs and they see this as the solution to all the damage that they're about to do. But then as we've seen with the pilot programs, it tends to be a very small number of people for a limited period of time and not enough money to really keep going. And that, well, that's, you know, it's a pilot program. It's not the whole thing. It's not what a lot of people might be envisioning. The fact that we can't really do a widespread one given the cost, I think is very relevant to the, the feasibility of a broader universal basic income system. And to us, in, in that context, it really kind of looks like, in a way, giving up on the concept of work that, well, we've got all this technology coming, we're not going to need workers anymore, here's the solution. And we, we would 
push back against that and say, no, we very much do still need workers. The focus should, if anything, kind of go in the opposite direction and say, we need to preserve workers. We need to protect jobs and protect the quality of jobs, give workers the right to organize so that they can have higher quality jobs rather than just kind of a, a, abandon the, the economy of the past and say, we'll try to replace it with universal basic income because we just think there are so many concerns with what the feasibility of large scale UBI might look like that our response so far has been pretty skeptical. Thank you. And, and Julianne, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, so I would I would agree with Mitch. Um, and part of it is because I am I'm not an expert on UBI at all. But um, everything that I have read and experienced suggests that work is such an integral part of not just an income, but in our contribution to society. But I can imagine maybe not any of the programs I've seen, but a program that bridged um, folks as they move from one kind of employment to another or for training purposes or something, um, in part because things like um, you know, unemployment and such are very problematic, uh, scorn, some people don't take advantage of some of these programs, but some kind of positive programming um, that allowed people to somehow support shifts that may be necessary that would still allow them to work. So not to let not to not to say that that companies should be allowed to at will sort of get rid of people, but we don't have a really good a, we don't have a system in place. We don't have the laws that some countries have that sort of that guard against um, you just being you know kind of automated out of your job or just let go for um, uh, for reasons of profit. So I can imagine being open to some kind of scheme that ensured people's ability to shift jobs or shift or get training within, um, within workplaces, in part because so many of them don't have that already. I mean, there are, pro there are progressive places or we can see them in the future that would allow people to move. We don't see that. Um, we have some fall, fallback, we have some uh, social support, doesn't always work well and some people don't wanna take advantage of it. So UBI in the sense of a possibility for something that's positive and progressive, yes, um, but I would in no way wanna to move towards a place where people are not working. I don't think that's good for us as communities. It's not good for people psychologically, um, et cetera. Great, thank you, Julianne. Um, so Victor, I know you had a question you wanted to pose. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to everybody. Uh, in my opening notes, I mentioned that I thought we were in a pretty unsettled time with respect to where progressive policies should be enacted, what makes the most sense. And it's true in almost every sector, but here when we're talking particularly about technology, um, I would pose the question of whether, and this is for anybody uh, who has an idea about it, what kind of policies, whether they be regulations or or, or legislation of different kinds is best put out, is best enacted at the local level by cities or counties. I mean, the cities control land use, of course, and often are the leaders in economic development strategies, and therefore all of, a lot of things of what we've been talking about could fall under their domain. Counties have responsibility for public health and for the criminal justice system and the land use and economic development in unincorporated areas and places like the Inland Empire, which involve three counties at least, um, could end up with very different policies if the counties went in different directions. And we see very progressive cities pass a few laws that wouldn't uh, get passed in other parts of the state of California. But what makes sense? What, what, what kind of laws are best done at the local level given how technology in some ways knows no boundaries. So my take is, I mean, first off, you get the wins where you can. If you can affect policy change that will take hold in a particular city, then by all means, work at the local level to implement it. Um, certainly if that's the best you can do and that the if the if the opportunity of state or federal legislation on the topic uh, is, you know, seems remote or uh, has uncertain prospects. That said, there, so I came actually 
before I was at CDT, I was at um, a management side law firm um, for several years. And one thing that I saw happen is that there was there were movements towards paid sick leave and predictive and secure scheduling laws happening all over uh, the country, mainly at the municipal level. But what happened is that conservative states uh, started passing laws prohibiting individual localities from establishing paid and paid sick leave laws and secure and uh, predictive scheduling laws. Preemption. So the problem with with local legislation is that it's vulnerable uh, to state level nullification essentially by that um, in many states. And yes, in California is, is maybe the best example of the state where the state government has allowed localities to be kind of laboratories for uh, pro worker policies in these spaces. But my experience and observations of what's happened in other spheres makes me, you know, very doubtful that th that local and municipal legislation is an effective um, route. The other thing that I'll just briefly say on that point is that in one of the other areas that I work on that I mentioned is automated employment decision tools um, or automated hiring tools. New York City was the first place to pass a law on that point, and the law is awful. The law was essentially written by vendors, and it imposes no new requirements on vendors or employers beyond what they basically already had to do under federal law anyway. And basically, that, that shows that at the local level, there's also much more potential for special interests to bring their resources to bear and get bad stuff passed, or what also happened there, um, the regulations implementing the New York City law weakened what was already a flawed law even further to the point that frankly the law i think is close to useless now so i'm i hate to be a downer about municipal law if you if you think that that if you think that you have a shot at getting good legislation on surveillance or another topic that protects workers pass at the local level by all means do so but there's lots of pitfalls to that approach that make me dubious that that's where resources are best placed for it thank you Thank you. Um, and, and maybe just a, a little follow on while we're looking at the range of different strategies. And, and I think maybe this is a question for Mitch. Um, can you share, uh, uh, we've talked about federal policies and state policies and local, and can you share any information about sort of union strategies? Are, are there examples of, of organizing union campaigns where this has been taken up, or is there examples of good contract language that's been negotiated to address these issues? Yes, there, there definitely are. And, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I meant to talk about that a little bit, but I, I already taken up too much time, so I didn't really cover it. But there are lots of different collective bargaining agreements out there that have gotten into this issue. The main one that comes to mind are the Teamsters at UPS. So a UPS truck is now covered with all sorts of GPS and cameras and sensors and all sorts of devices that most workers would, you know, if they could wave a wand, would probably want to get rid of, but the workers have a lot of say in those devices that's given to them through their contracts. Um, one standard that's in there is that it, there has to be a human being involved in any kind of disciplinary decision, uh, in contrast to Amazon Flex drivers who may go their entire career with Amazon Flex and never deal with an actual person, you know, hired by a computer and fired by a computer. And so, that's kind of the main example that comes to mind, but there are some other ones out there. It's a big issue in healthcare. The California Nurses Association and NSCIU have gotten involved in some of these issues in the past that there has definitely been some creeping of algorithmic management into healthcare, specifically decision-making that's taking some decision-making responsibilities and abilities away from those workers. And so they've been pushing back against those. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what's actually in their CBAs, but there's probably something. But it, in terms of laboratories that are out there where we can find approaches that make sense, this is one that we think really does make sense because it's very focused on a given work site, very focused on a given set of job duties. So it's very difficult to do a law at the state level that covers every worker out there and all the different things that they do. It's much more straightforward to sit down with a bargaining unit 
and say, all right, what are the problems? And they're like, you know, these cameras on the trucks, we really got to do something about that. That's the number one priority. And so you can focus on, you can not just focus on whatever the biggest problems are, but you've got a pretty good chance of success because there's a real threat there to the employer of, you know, if we don't get what we want, there could be a strike. And so it not only puts those pushing for a stronger pro-worker policy in place in a very good position to get what they need, but I think it makes it a lot more likely for that policy to not be what uh, you know a bunch of legislators think makes sense and what we can actually get through the process without taking too many hits. It's more, this is what we need. This is the language that makes sense. It needs to go into this contract, and then we will enforce it. You're not entrusting a state agency that might be new to this whole topic or maybe more employer friendly than you might like. Um, it's essentially enforced by the union who is, you know, as pro worker of an institution as exists out there. And so in a lot of different ways, that's an approach that, that can really make a lot of sense. Great. Thank you. Um, and a, a question came in while we're um, on the subject of vehicles. Somebody's asking, how about systems that might allow management to monitor audio in service vehicles? Anybody familiar with that? issue? Anybody has any comments on that? I, I can't say that the issue of video surveillance of transit operators came up a lot when we were doing 1651 and researching the issue in the lead up to that. And is one area where it, there are some workers out there who actually do want to be on some sort of a recording device in case of uh, you know, attacks from passengers or where there could be accusations from passengers or customers that a worker did this or that thing. So it it in some way complicates our ability to do legislation in this area. Another reason why doing it through a CBA makes a lot of sense, but that generally speaking, workers don't like being recorded or monitored, but there are some narrow cases where it, it does make a lot of sense, but then it gets into a lot of the issues that Matt's been raising about workers having more control over that data and access to it, and that when they don't work there anymore, it's not kept, that it's not sold off to some third party, and that um, in other ways that workers have more rights to what actually is protected. But um, I think you know, by and large, most workers don't want to be recorded. So the, the rule of thumb is no, but there are some workers who very much do want, in, in narrow circumstances, do want that to happen, that sort of thing to happen. Thank you. Um, I, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I wanted to just see if there's anyone who has anything they would want to share before we close. And thank you all for your participation. But if, if there's any last points anyone wants to make, we have a moment to give you that opportunity. Um, Matt and Tim, take a few last words from both of you. Go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to briefly plug their, the um, White House released a statement that the uh, Office of Science and the Office of Science and Technology Policy then released an RFI, a request for information on workplace surveillance. Um, that was uh, earlier this week. So there's an opportunity for both individuals and civil society organizations to weigh in on this issue. And um, one of the things that they focused on was the potential for surveillance systems to threaten the health and safety of workers. Um, and I'll plug some work that my organization did with Governing for Impact on that work. We sent a series of memoranda to the Occupational Safety and Health Authority and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, asking them for ta to take action to examine the impacts of surveillance systems on workers' health and safety. So this is an area where federal policy um, is at least taking a closer look at surveillance issues. So there's maybe a moment and an opportunity um, for people who are interested in this space to get more involved and to make a difference. And if people wanted to provide comments, how would they find, is there a website? Do you want to give a, any, any more information? Sure. Um, if you just Google um, OSTP, uh rfi workplace surveillance you should be able, you should go right to either the white house blog post or the federal registry entry that seeks information on that failing that feel free to reach out to me uh m share at cdt.org and i'm happy to um, provide the information that you need in order to submit comments thank you and tim i'm going to give you the last word 
so just a, a final thought uh, this was going back to Victor's question about I think another avenue of thinking about um, effect influencing these systems is that um, particularly like in warehousing, for example, if you look at the companies that are implementing these technologies and then what they get in terms of tax breaks and incentives to grow their businesses and come into communities like the Inland Empire, uh, I think we really need to be, be looking at that. If we think these systems are leading to high turnover, to injuries, that then have a really huge impact on the community and on our social welfare systems, that's not a really good bargain for a community or for a state or for our society. Um, and yet, you know, we often incentivize these these programs because of the, the jobs they're supposedly bringing. So, you know, we have a long history in the labor movement and the environmental movement, I think, demanding certain qualities from new developments and in, in exchange for tax breaks. I think that's an area to start to think about uh, if, if we think of, you know, workplace surveillance uh, and these rights as a measure of job quality um, that we should be talking about in these conversations. Thank you so much. And I also want to note that Michelle put in the link, uh, a link to the site if people are interested in providing comments. It is a really important opportunity. So thank you for bringing that up, Matt. Um, and so we've reached the end of our panel. I wanted to, I want to thank you all so much for participating. And um, even more importantly, importantly for the work that you're doing to really make sure that technology, we've heard a lot about worker-centered, start from the value of promoting and enhancing workers' quality of life and jobs, and rather than using technology to control and degrade workers. And so um, we really thank you for the important work you're doing in that area. I look forward to having you continue to share strategies and ideas um, with everyone so that we can support those efforts. So thank you so much. Um, I think this is the, I'm going to close the panel. I'm going to turn it back over to Christina.